the morning. Time to wake up. Maybe make a nice cup of coffee. And ooh, how about a game? Something nice and light. An easy breezy start to the day. This is Square on Sale, and it is absolutely not one of those kind of games. Wait, what was this intro supposed to be again? Hi, right, Minasan Konnichiwa, and welcome to the Board Game Dojo's Import or Not series, where we talk to you about games from East Asia and let you know if they're worth your hard-earned money to import or not. Today, we are talking about Sawada Taiju's Square on Sale, a game that was designed in the dark ages of... 2005 and it basically asks the question what if we made a hard game like Othello even harder by adding in an auction mechanic now today's video is going to be a little bit different because we put a poll on Twitter and asked you hey do you want us to keep doing what we've been doing and put the how to play in the same video as the review and the results were 50 50 as to separate them or keep them together so we're going to try something new today and we are just going to have this video be our thoughts on the game as we kind of go over an overview of the game so we can at least tell you what we think and then in a separate video we're going to teach you how to play so what is square on sale well, it is a game in which you are going to try to take control of certain squares on the board. At the end of the game, you get a certain number of points based on how many blocks are beneath you on the square that you are in control of. So then, well, how do you take control of a square? Well, you take control of a spot by putting in a bid. You'll put in a certain amount of money into the square, and then you'll start the timer, which starts at two rounds, which means that if nobody outbids you in the next two rounds, then you get that spot. So you'll go around, you'll put the bid down, you'll go around the board, come back to you. Ooh, is that clock's going to go to one turn. And now final thing up, oh, nobody outbids you. All right, congratulations. You are now in control of that square. Now, the thing about Square on Sale is I told you it was a little bit like Othello. And here is where that comes in. You see, when you take control of a spot, you not only take control of the spot that you just won, but if you own another spot that is in a straight line from the spot you just took control of, you also take control of the spots in between. Let me show you here on this board. Let's pretend that we are blue and we are going to take control of this spot. We've just won this spot because nobody outbid us. Now you can see that we already owned this spot over here as well, and somebody owns those buildings in between. But when we take control of this new spot here, and now we get to take control and put our block down on top of the spots in between the spot we just won and the spot that we already owned because somebody already owns those buildings. Now this part is so cool because it completely changes the landscape of the entire board. In a moment's notice, the whole outlook of the game has changed. And now you've made somebody else need to adjust their strategy. Okay, well, I wanted to keep control of that spot. So now I need to start bidding on spots so that I can take those spots back. And for those of you who have played Othello, I bet you're thinking about something right now. Well, the best spot in Othello is, of course, the corners. So why don't I just go for those? And that's where we get to the next part because there is some brilliance here that keeps you from maybe trying to get those corners too soon. The first thing is that I kind of mentioned that somebody else has to be in control of the buildings first in order for you to take control of that. If there's nothing there, then you don't get to do that nice Othello, put everything in between and you can take control of all of those. So if you try to take the corners too early before people have a chance to take control of the spots in the center grid or maybe along the edges, you just kind of wasted it because you're not going to take control of anything extra other than that one corner. And that's going to be very, very harsh in this game because did I mention that the money can be a problem? You see, at the beginning of the game, you start with all of the money that you are going to be able to have for the entirety of the game. This is not a game in which you're going to be able to take other people's money from them and add it into your little economy there. But throughout the game, you're going to be able to get some money back. You see, the board is laid out in three sections, the center section, the edges and the corners. In the center section, the first thing you're going to do on each turn is actually take back some of the money from the squares that have nothing bidding on them, but only from the center section. 
The edges you might be able to get some of your money back from, but you have to forego your bid for this round, meaning you don't get to bid on any new squares for this round, which is an absolute killer. In fact, the rule book mentions that this is actually called a pass. You are passing on the point of the game just so you can get back some money from those edges. But the corners, well, you are never getting that money back. It will sit there. And so you better hope that you make the most use of that money there because if you go too early, you lose that money for the rest of the game. And if you don't use that efficiently and effectively, well, that was just a waste of a very finite resource. And what I hope that I'm imparting on you is that this game is so much about not only the spatiality of figuring out where is the best spot to go, but it's also when. When can you put together a nice little combo of putting down a square here, taking control there, and then setting it up so in that in two turns you're going to take control of this one. Then the next turn, as you flip this one over to the one turn left, you're going to go over here so that hopefully you win that bid and this bid, and then you can get everything in between. And assuredly, you're going to sit there hoping that nobody else is paying attention to you. Oh man, I'm in panic. Okay, okay. I'm hoping that I've got this nice little thing set up. I've got a couple of turns. I hope nobody notices what I'm doing. But the other people at the table are, are hoping the same thing, that you aren't paying attention to what they are doing. And there's this nice little back and forth as the landscape of the board, this city that you are building in an abstract way, starts to take shape and take color. And this, in the, that initial impression that the corners are good, but maybe not as good all the time. It's one of those tweaks. It's one of those rules that you can tell that this game was lovingly crafted and play tested to make sure that everything had a purpose and everything had a balance, if you will. Another one of those rules is this center spot because the center spaces are maybe not the most attractive, especially because most of, more often than not, you're not going to be able to keep control of them for very long, especially once people start going out to the edges and everything in between starts switching players. So why would you want to do it? Well, to start the game, the last thing you're going to do on your turn is you're going to put a gem on one of the center spaces that don't have any bids on it yet. And then the next player will do the same thing. They'll put a bid down somewhere on the board and then they'll get to choose one of the center area to put another gem down and so on and so forth. Now those gems on each spot will go to the player who builds on that spot first. Meaning that at some point, when those gems start to pile up and one spot starts to become worth five, six, seven, maybe eight points, and eight points is a lot, you start to rethink your strategy of, okay, I wasn't really planning on going there, especially because I know that that spot is going to change hands many, many times throughout the game. but. Maybe it's worth it for me to try to build there just to get some quick points. And that's exactly what these gems are able to do. They're able to change your viewpoint on a certain section of the board, but they also mark a bit of a section of the game length that's over, a bit of the story arc that's over. I'm not a reviewer who often talks about the game arc, which maybe is a shortcoming of my review process, but I don't really genuinely think about it often when I play, but it's hard not to when you're playing Square on Sale because the gems part of the game really only happens for the first quarter or third of the game because after a while everybody's taken up all the center spots so you no longer are putting gems on unowned zones. But at the same time, once that part of the game is over, you're kind of doing step one more that you didn't do at the beginning of the game, which is taking money from center spots that you owned. It's almost as if the gems not only make it attractive to start building in the center spot, but because people start building on the center spot, it is starting up the economy. It's waking up the economy. The fact that now, now that people have built in the center, people can actually start getting their money back and start investing it in other parts of the board. And that's kind of where that middle part is, where you go from a cloth sheet that is black, that looks grayscale, and then you start adding a little bit of color and you start adding the timers for different players. And all of a sudden the board starts filling up 
as people start to build their towers and then people start to take the tower over from them and then people start building on top of them and it's kind of amazing in a way that this game abstracts down what city builders are kind of going for with minis but this one just does it with blocks and the middle section of the game is full of this the back and forth the i'm going to take control and then somebody else takes control back and then you start to get to the ending where the board has mostly filled up and you start watching for those end game conditions the first end game condition is if somebody uses up all of their blocks so as you're starting to get to the end of this crescendo of the game, you start watching other people. How many blocks do they have left compared to me? How much have they built on the board? But the other one is one that incites panic as soon as it happens. You see, the other end game condition is if all the spots on the board have filled up. And this is where I think you get the most exciting ends of this game. Because no matter what, when somebody puts a bid on that last spot, that marks the end game like hey in two turns this game is over without fail the other players at the table look down at the board and go okay wait where are they at like what what why are they so confident in ending the game right now what is the game state that they're in right now but also what is the game state that i'm in right now am i okay with this game ending what do i have going on the board am i gonna have enough points to take the victory mm, probably not so then it would probably be good if i can delay them winning that final spot so that the game doesn't end yet but wait hold on i need to bid on these other spots so i can change the game state so i hope that somebody else can maybe outbid them so that the end game is then delayed a little bit more Meanwhile, everybody else at the table is thinking the exact same thing of, I am not ready for this game to end. I hope somebody else can figure that out. It is this sudden realization that all your plans hopefully, hopefully went well, but more often than not, didn't go exactly as you planned. And at the very end, when they put that last block on the table and probably take control of a lot of things and change the landscape of the board one last time, you can at least see that you and your friends or whoever you're playing it with at the table completely changed this grayscale cloth map into something great. It's hard to describe because this game actually made me feel regret. It made me regret writing off abstract games for so long. You see, I don't really like abstract games that much, or I didn't really think I did. And my wife is also not a huge fan of them. Every once in a while, there are special exceptions of it. And we've talked about some on the podcast and on the video. More often, when I hear of a game like Yinch or a game like Corridor, I go, okay, I can see I, some people appreciate it, but it's just not something that I am interested in. And Square on Sale actually just made me rethink all of that. It makes me want to go back and try some of these games games because square on sale to me just feels cool it's a cool game it's cool that this game is pretty much handcrafted it's cool that that means that some of the pieces are have a little bit of imperfections to them in the in the little wooden blocks but at the same time it's kind of cool just building a city with those like i love me some minis but it's just kind of cool bringing it all down to a mere abstraction it's cool bringing a game from 2005 that doesn't look like it's going to be anything special and then the people at the table start figuring out the puzzle and it's cool that by the end of that first game the rules have gotten out of the way it's cool that this game does what i think other tough games cannot do you see, I think that there are many ways in which a board game can be difficult. And the weighting system that maybe Board Game Geek has, or talking about something as a heavyweight, or a middleweight, or a lightweight game, it has different meanings to different people. I think often enough, like let's say a Vito Lacerda game, I like Lacerda games. So I say this with as much appreciation and love for it as I can. But so much of that game, or the first game, the second game, the third games, are figuring out how the puzzle even works. In Kanban, how is it that I can even build the car? 
in squaring on sale, it quickly gets out of the way of, at first, okay, yeah, there's a little bit of rules that I need to remember, but quickly, those quickly get out of the way and it starts becoming, how can I even be good at this game? This game has so much for me to concentrate on. And then that's not even mentioning what the other players are doing. How do I become good at this game? And you're going to spend a few games doing this. How can I get better with my timing? How can I get better spatially? And then soon enough, you're going to, if you play with the same group of the people, start going, how can I play better against them? Because they're very aggressive on the edges. How can I beat them to it while still not bankrupting myself? There's just so much to improve on in this game. And that's where the difficulty comes in. It's not in understanding the rules. It's not understanding how the game works. It's understanding how to be good at it. And so now we need to take it from there and say, okay, it's a cool game, but let's talk a little bit about price and accessibility, because that is usually where we get to, is it worth the import or not? So this game retails for about 6,000 yen, which is about $45, a little bit more pricier than a lot of the games that we cover on this channel. And you can usually get a used copy at Sudogaya for about 4,000 yen ish. But either way, you're talking about pretty spendy game when including import fees as well on top of that. So we really want to make sure that this game is a maybe very unique. It's unlike something you've played before you can get for 20 bucks where you're from. We also want to make sure it's replayable. If you're going to spend that much on the game, I hope you're going to play it more than once or that you're interested in playing it more than once. So is it unique? Is it replayable? And for $45, it better be right. And our answers to that are an absolute yes. This game is wholly unique. I've never seen another game like it in which uses the Othello, okay, if you take control of this, then everything in between this spot and the spot you already owned is now yours. And it is so cool. I want to seek out other games that do that. So if you know other games that do that, please leave a comment down below. It's a war of money. It's a war of timing. It's a war of spatiality. And that is something that everybody can improve on. And it is a unique thing to try to get better at. It feels like one of those brain exercises that I used to do on the DS when I was a kid. I don't, I don't remember what those games were called, but it just gamifies something that feels like you're actually training your brain to get better at. And at the same time, is it replayable? Yes, because you want to get better at it. In fact, when I brought this over, we played it once, we played it twice. And it was a couple weeks before we met up again and we were getting ready to play something like Ark Nova or Earth, you know, one of those the new hotnesses, right? But instead, the person who was hosting just said, hey, Eric, can you bring back that square game? I want to play that first. And for a game that's from 2005 to be on the forefront of somebody's mind, not the latest hotness, they want to replay it that badly. They want to try it again that badly. I mean, that's just cool. So do we recommend this game? I think it's pretty obvious at this point that, yeah, we absolutely do. In fact, for only the second time, the other one being Yokohama, we are giving this a three out of three stars, which means we think this is an absolute essential for you to track down and play. We think everybody can appreciate this. I'm a guy who doesn't like abstracts. I'm a guy who doesn't really like spatial puzzles, and I love this game. It made me rethink my entire thinking behind a whole genre of game. And if that's not a special game, then I don't know what is. Thank you so much for watching today. If you liked the video, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. We really appreciate it. We have a lot of new changes that are coming up both on our YouTube channel and on the podcast. And you can leave a comment below. What did you think of this that we're separating out the how-to video and the review? Thanks again so much for watching. Arigatou gozaimashita. Tane.